Chanaru, Toroku, Ine, Rushko Nigashimas. Please like and subscribe. Thank you. People in Africa, like, really, like, a lot of times, you know, especially the ones that come from poverty, but the struggle is so bad that whenever, whenever the opportunity is given, uh, I, I feel like we're so hungry to do everything that we can. All right, welcome to another special episode of Ike Max. We have a special guest, a monthly MVP of the B, B League. Ike, you want to bring him in? Mr. Triple Double, Assist King, Step Back, Fade Away King, Face Up Game King, <laughs> Julian Mavunga. Welcome to the show, my brother. How you doing, fellas? Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. I'm doing all right, you know, just chilling in my home here in Toyama. Thanks for coming on. So I kind of want to get started. Um, I saw your hometown was in Zimbabwe. Uh, how mm -hmm. was your upbringing? What's your background like? Um, upbringing was a little rough, uh, if we're being honest. Like, you know, uh, uh, Zimbabwe is a country that's just, you know, it's just been hammered with poverty uh, in the sense of a little bit of, uh, you know, corruption. Uh, so uh, it, it, was a, it was a tough time coming up. Uh, and, you know, I'm so, I'm so thankful to like my my parents and the the work that they put in to, you know, uh, help get our family to America where it was a place of, uh, that we could have more opportunity. And most certainly now I play professional basketball. And so this is my little sister who plays for the uh, Chicago Sky and she's also playing overseas in Russia right now. So it just brought us lots of opportunity from an education standpoint, from just a standpoint of, you know, becoming whatever we wanted to become uh, because you know, even even to this day, you know, I, I look at the country of Zimbabwe and I see a lot of people that struggle, you know, um, uh, day, normal day to day activities, you know, health care, like, you know, it, it just helps me be thankful uh, for, for, you know, everything that I've had in my life and everything that I have right now. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of countries that are like that, and you know, kind of struck by poverty and uh, people go through a lot out there. For sure. Um, how old were you when you when your mother and father decided to move you guys over? So I think um, my my father actually left first. So crazy story. My father left the country. Uh, you know, whole family there left us uh, just to kind of go try to figure it out. Uh, you know, so it's all about like community. It's all about like you know like uh, you know those friendships and family bonds that you have. We went to go stay with uh, uh, my one of my uncles uh, and his family. Um, you know, kind of just figuring it out, yeah, getting some jobs here and there, just trying to figure out, you know, what exactly path you could take to make it possible for us to come out. And I think that at that point in time, I was, I want to say I was eight years old. Uh, and so he was in America for a whole year. Um, uh, me and my mom, my brother, my sister, we stayed back, uh, you know, and he was just trying to, you know, set the foundation for us. And then after a year, we ended up, uh, you know, leaving, we packed up and left and I came to America and it's crazy. Like whenever we first moved to America, I don't even know, like it was one of those like Nissan, like um, with the lights, you know, you know how the cool cars with the like lights that used to come up. Like my dad had one of those, it was a two door, but it'd be like me, my mom, my, my brother, my sister, my dad. And then uh, we also moved with my cousin because my cousin was, uh, uh, you know, uh, a little bit older than us and she was going to move. Uh, with us to help, uh, you know, babysit us and whatnot. So it'd be six of us, and we would just squeeze into that little two-door Nissan, dude. Uh, I think my dad was working for UPS or FedEx, and my mom at first was working, you know, at Walmart, you know, and she went in and started studying, and, you know, they they just built over the years, man. It's, it's amazing what they did. Oh, that's excellent, man. So – what was it like that first year you get to America? Was it just a culture shock for you? It was culture shock elite. You know, that was back in the day when everybody used to call call you African booty scratcher, man. Oh, man, I heard <laughs> that so many times. Uh, like, you know, you're, you're the new kid on the block. Uh, you're, you're the funny kid. You're, you know, the funny looking kid, you know, the one with the funny accent. And, you know, but it was hard uh, if I'm to be completely honest. Like America, it, it, it was really hard for me to adjust to. It's like trying to like figure out 
who I am. Like I went from being this like little African kid and then like now I'm in America and it's a culture shock with like, you know, like, well, I got black friends. I got white friends. I got, it's like, you know, and we lived in the hood, like in the hood, hood. And like, so it's like, I'm trying to like adjust to that. But then like, you know, also in African culture, you know, your, your, your family wants you to be a certain way. So it, it was tough for me being that African kid in that African community, but wanting to come out of my shell and like make my own identity. And it's just really difficult to pick up on like, what do you want to be? Like, who do you want to be? You know, I, I kind of wanted to listen to hip hop music. I, of course, my parents didn't want any hip hop music in their house. And, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard. It's a lot, you know. Uh, and, and there's a lot of kids that do it. A lot of kids go through it. And, uh, you know, you got to kind of figure, figure it out with time. And so how did you get into basketball? Because I can imagine with your parents being immigrants, they would want you to focus on your education before anything. And you know, basketball takes a lot of dedication. So how did you end up following that path? I actually, um, funny story. Uh, I think I tried out for the basketball team in eighth grade. Uh, (laughs) Like, you got to understand, this is eighth grade. I still, they were so like anti- things that take away from school and learning and everything that I went to basketball trials in jean shorts. It's a true story. (laughs) I got her. I go, I go to basketball trials. I try out. I had never played basketball before, but I was a tall kid. So I made the team. But then uh, my dad was like, well, you don't have a 3.0. So you can't play basketball. Like he didn't care anything about basketball or what it could have, you know, have become or anything like that. And straight up just said, no, you're not going to play on the basketball team. So it was always, you know, education first, school first. Like that's that's what they were all about, uh, you know, from a strict background. And I can't say I have any complaints about it because it's helped me become the person that I am today. So, uh, you know, I had to just make sure I was focused on both. I was focusing in the classroom and, uh, you know, focusing on the basketball court as well. So I, I gave it up completely, wasn't playing. And the first time I went back to it i was walking in my neighborhood uh from the park you know i had been hanging out with some friends and uh this car red uh i don't know i don't even remember what kind of car but this red sedan just pulled up right next to me and this guy just looks at me he's like hey there fella i was like hey, how you doing <laughs> he's like uh you, you don't by any chance play basketball do you i was like uh, no not really he's like do you want to start i was like yeah he's like how you doing? My name is Joshua Kinder. I'm the new head basketball coach at Brownsburg High School, and that, which is the high school that I w- was about to go to. So my high school coach literally found me walking back home, like as if he was like driving around recruiting or something and <laughs> ran into me. He's just like, yo, come to workouts tomorrow. And that was the beginning of it. How tall were you at that time? Then? Six, man, I was eighth grade going into freshman year. I was probably about six, five, six, six. You were that tall, that young? I was, yeah, man, I was tall. I was a big kid, man. Not to mention, like, two years before that, I was, like, 5'10", like, 260. Wow. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, I hit a little growth spurt in between, I want to say, uh, seventh and seventh grade in uh, high school, like, freshman year, and I was, I was like, 6'6", six, six, six as a freshman. 6'6", six, six with no sky. I knew nothing about basketball. I had never played basketball organized my entire life. It's crazy, though. I talked to CB about it, and he says you guys played together in the past, and you were a five man. I was, and this isn't in the past, like in high school. My rookie year, whenever I played uh, professional basketball as a rookie, CB was the four man. I started at the five, and my job was to catch the ball. Like the, the, the most skilled thing I would do was catch the ball in the high post, and they would set a screen for CB, and I would pass it to him. Other than that, it was picking, rolling, and it was nothing but low post work. That's I didn't like make a I didn't make day. a single three. I didn't make a single three my rookie year. If you go back and look at the stats, I don't think I made a single three. That's like night and day to how you play now, man. You're one of the best wings out here. Yeah, I mean, I, but I, I have a great basketball trainer that I ran into uh, lots of years of just putting in work and building and like, you know, because because my rookie year it was like, yeah, I could try to be an undersized five, but if I expand my game and can do more and I have more skills, you know. I mean, my dream was just to become a good, like, you know, stretch four, stretch five, but I kept building. And it's like, whenever you make a goal to achieve something, you get, you achieve it. Then you're like, 
okay, what's the next thing? That's how it always was with me and my game. It's like, okay, I, I'm a good catch and shoot guy now. What am I going to do next? Okay, well, now let me get better at, you know, driving or let me get better at, you know, jabbing or whatever. I actually stole my – I'm not – First time I've ever said it publicly, I stole my jab a series from CB. I perfected it, but I definitely stole it from CB. I'll definitely let him know you said that. Yeah, he he knows. He 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 does not. He never lets a day go by when we see each other. He doesn't at some point in time bring it up. Hey, hey remember when I used to do the jazz and you started copying it? <laughs> Yo, I, I stole it from CB. So you got kind of started late in basketball, and obviously you worked extremely hard to get to the level you're at now. Um, I'm curious because I kind of see this. It's, it's common with um, athletes that have uh, roots in Africa. I would say mm-hmm. like Francis Ngannou for UFC, also Kamara Usman. Like they talk about their yeah. background a lot, and they talk mm-hmm. about how much pride they take into like their work ethic and all that. So what's that mentality that you have uh, that you put into basketball? I think... This is, and this is not me knocking or like, you know, disrespecting anyone or anyone's culture, but like, like, like there's people like, even like, you know, like I said, like in the hood that, you know, like struggle, you know, but, but, you know, even in America, there's parks, there's, you know, there, there's opportunity to do something. Like I, I, I told this story about, I used to play soccer when I was in Zimbabwe and dude, when I tell you, like, we would take, this is how you, we made our soccer balls and take a bunch of newspapers, you ball them up, make it wet, ball it up like try to make it as round as possible and then you would put it into a plastic bag and then you would just take like six plastic bags six seven eight plastic bags and just keep wrapping it around wrapping it around put tape on it like get some fire burn it so that it doesn't you know because you know what happens when you burn plastic and then put more plastic and more potato. that's how we made that and that's how we played soccer and of course it we would just find like any open field anywhere where, where it was just you know, playing on stone and anything. Somebody would bring extra shoes, push, put a shoe here, put a shoe there. That's, that was our goalpost, you know? And then it'd be like, okay, like, don't go past that. Don't go past this. You know, it's like people in Africa, like really like a lot of times, like, you know, especially the ones that come from poverty, that the struggle is so bad that whenever, whenever the opportunity is given, uh, I, I feel like we're so hungry to do everything that we can. Like, for me to get to where I was, I mean, I went my freshman year, I was 6'6", six, six, you know, and you would think, oh, 6'6", six, six, you know, big 6'6", six, six, 230, 240. Like, you would think, oh, like, that sounds like a varsity chart. The guy that was playing varsity center was 6'2", six, six, like 170. You know, he played over me. I was that bad. So it was like I started playing, but, like, it wasn't enough to start playing. So I would I would literally just go to the gym for – even if I didn't have a rebound for, like, five hours. It's like I got a gym? You know, I got, I, I know what the struggle is like for, for kids out there that, you know, just get a, a hula hoop and cut it and try to make a basket out of it. So it's like America gives people so much opportunity, you know, and, and even, even today, America still has things that it needs to work on, you know, from a racial perspective and other things that I won't get into. But I think that whenever you look at a hungry lion, for example, like a hungry lion is going to go out there and really hunt. Whereas you've got a well-fed lion that you keep in like, you know, the zoo and you give, give it all the food that it wants all the time. It's kind of like, yeah, you know, eat now. it doesn't really have to hunt for anything. So when you give us that opportunity, we're going to hunt. And I think that that's a cultural thing. See, it's crazy that you talk about it like that, because as Americans, we sometimes get, we kind of take for granted all the blessings that we were born with, even when, like, I grew up in a lot of poverty when I was younger, but I had a soccer ball. Like, that analogy for me really helps me put my head around the difference in just opportunity and circumstance by where you were born, basically. Yeah, uh, and it's just, I think that for a lot of people, a lot of people have their struggles, and a lot of people don't understand other people's struggles. But, like, as someone who grew up as a child in, in Zimbabwe and then grew up to America uh, and came to America. When I came to America, we were in the hood and I was happy. Like, you know, like I was happy. I was excited because, you know, we had these things like we had team sports, we had, you know, activities, stuff like that. Whereas like, you know, in Zimbabwe right now, you know, like you, you had the opportunity to go get a scholarship to go play. You tell me if I get good at this, I can go get a scholarship. You know, there's not Zimbabwean college or the African colleges that are giving out, out full rides to kids for being good at basketball. You know, that's why you always see kids 
you know, have these stories about coming from over there. Joel and B. I mean, we can list people, you know, like people that come from there and come to America and make something of themselves, you know. So opportunity is it's, it's just it's all about perspective, man. It's all about perspective. Is that something that you kind of draw back to when when you're training and things get hard mentally and you kind of like go yeah. back to your your beginning, uh, the beginning of your story and kind of like the struggle? I think that I have this uh, something deep in me uh, that's you have this fear of like failure. You have this fear of, you know, and aside from the fear, you also have this guilt, like this opportunity, like how hard my parents work to get us to move to America and giving me this opportunity. It's like, like, what am I, who am I to like not make the most of it? You know how many kids, you know, are stuck out there? Uh, you know, w- without the opportunity that my parents were able to give me through their hard work, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's not it's not easy at all, like to do what my parents did, you know, like my mom uh, to continue their story. You know, my dad was working for FedEx, but he ended up, you know, kind of getting into it was a uh, singular singular wireless at the time. He was working for singular, started, you know, working his way up in the company. My mom, dude, she would go back. Uh, I, I watched them. My mom would was working at uh, Walmart. Then she would work somewhere else, work multiple jobs. And then like, dude, I, I'm telling you, I would wake up at like three in the morning to use the restroom, you know, or something whenever I was a kid. And I would like open the door. My mom is sitting on the toilet, like well, not literally sitting on the toilet, studying because that's the quietest place in the house. She doesn't want to disturb anyone. She's She got her books on the sink. She's studying to be a nurse, you know, and she, she made her way up. Uh, you know, from a CNA to a QNA, she's an RN now, but that was all hard work. She would work her two jobs, 16 hours, and then study for like another six hours, sleep for like four, start two or four, whatever the math is on that, started all over again the next day. And so like, for me to see that example, for me to also see the examples of the people that didn't get the opportunity, and for me to just see the opportunity that, that I have and I've been given, like, I mean, I, I, I would... I, how how can I not, man? How can I not work hard whenever that's what I've been raised around? So that kind of kind of gives me like a little insight into your legendary summer workouts, because a lot of guys they work out in the summer, but you're a grinder. Like you're in the gym a lot, grind. and you're posting it on social media. Like does that mentality carry over into that? Yeah, absolutely. Like I mean, my my I never you know, it's not, and even whenever I post on social media, it's just like. I really just share what's being posted. You know, I, it's, it's not like I'm thirsty to be like, Hey y'all look what I'm doing. Like, you know, but like I'm in the gym, you know, enough to, you know, make sure that I get better every single year make sure I add to my game every single year. And actually Shane Whittington was uh, with me the whole summer, this summer COVID was happening. Uh, so we, we, you know, it was a hard to get a gym. I would drive to get to the gym from my house downtown to get to the gym. It was like a 50 minute drive. Made the drive five days a week the whole summer. Didn't matter. We woke up. I woke up at 5.15 every day uh, or maybe like 5, 5.40 every day. We would be in the weight room, you know, right before 7 a.m. lifting. We would lift for an hour. We lift with the Butler uh, men's back or Butler program strength coach. Um, and then we would um, from there, we would drive our 45 minutes or whatever to the north side of town. Like I'm talking about in the boom. Like in the middle of nowhere, basically, it was actually this family that was kind to us. They have a house with a barn right next to it. And in the barn, they have a full court basketball court. And we would grind in there. We were in there five days a week for it. Didn't matter how much gas I had to pay for it. Didn't matter. None of that matter. It's just the opportunity to grind, especially during COVID. So, you know, whenever I came back, I, I was ready for season because it's like, despite the pandemic, I was going to do whatever it took for me to be able to, you know, continue adding, continue building my game, continue maintaining. Because it's gotten hard over the years. You know, like, whenever I first got to Japan, it was like, I could just pick a pop and it'd be fine. And then, like, people started switching and, like, you know, like, even my career out here, like, people adjust to the way I play. So, like, I gotta be able to come back and do something every single year. Because if you don't grind, <laughs> you don't shine, I guess. Yeah, that's a, a good point. I was I wanted to ask you that, though, because you've had some really good years in Japan. You've led the league in assists before. You've been on some really good teams. But I think this is the first year you've gotten, like, the monthly MVP, and it seems like it's clicked. Like, you, you're an all-star this year. 
it seems like your game is taking that next step. What do you contribute to that? Uh, a lot of it, to be honest, is uh, mentally just trusting, trusting, and also not only worrying about me, but trusting other guys and helping them in like positions. Like, you know, I, even in Kyoto, it was like, okay, I'll just do this and I'll, you know, make that pass and get someone to assist. But, you know, like even with like, for example, with one of my young guys, I'll tell him like, look, you know, like you're going to be in this position on screen. Like I try to like, you know, give them a little bit of like what I know, especially like mentally, because like people see different things. And I've been doing a lot of listening this year. Uh, you know, I'm playing with Uto this year and like, you know, playing with him and making sure that him and I can coexist. That's got to be a lot of communication and a lot of seeing like places where we can be successful. So making sure that everyone around me is comfortable and not just me, that's, that's been big. But uh, other than that, I haven't, I haven't hunted points. I haven't hunted assists at all this year. I just feel like I, I play in the flow of the game. You know, one game I might literally have 12 and the next game I might have 40, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to do what the defense, uh, take what the defense gives us. Uh, and I think that, you know, being on this team, you know, having Josh, having Solo and having like a good young core around this has it's, it's been great. You got some good pieces. You guys do have some good pieces with Naoki and Okada, and then you guys mm-hmm. got Maeta there, and your mm-hmm. import. Like you guys got some really good good pieces on that team, and I think the organization did a good job of building up that roster this year. Absolutely. Um, whenever I look around, I mean, we have guys that are just threats in many ways. We got guys that play hard, play, play hard on both ends of the floor. We got guys that can handle the ball. I don't. I don't feel like I always have to have the ball to you know. Uh, and, and we, we got guys, I think, that, uh, you know, everyone's going to have an ego as a basketball player. But I think that we got guys that will listen to each other. So, like, whenever I say something to, let's say, Uto, I feel like he listens to me. And then whenever, let's say, Okada says something to me, uh, I think I listen to him. And I think that everyone coexisting and figuring it out as we go and adjusting every single game, that's what's been important. That's what's been very key to our success. Uh, I want to go back to your first year in Japan. Uh, I think you came here in 2015 for Shiga. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was the BJ League at the time. Yeah. Um, what was that experience like first coming to a, a different country? And Japan is, um, yeah, I mean, the culture is completely different from what you're used to. So how was that adjustment like? And um, have you, uh, I guess, um, assimilated to this culture now? Oh, man, it, 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 it took some time. Like I was such a homebody my first year. Like, like I was in, I was I was in Shiga, and you know, I I just spent so much time in the house because like the culture was so different. Nobody understood anything. Like I felt, like, especially in the you know smaller city like Shiga. Uh, so like you know I just kind of like play basketball and I would just uh you know go back home chill. Um, Japan is a very uh, in a sense of like adjusting it's difficult because like you know a lot of people don't speak english uh and then you got obviously like uh the characters you know you can't read anything uh so communication is hard and it it was it was hard for me my first year and like i i was just like kind of like whatever but then like i kind of realized you know its potential is I, i interacted more and more with the people and i saw how much the fans you know like like where they wanted to be like a part of your life they you know more so than any country here like you know how like you go to the games and there's fans that you see like oh that's so and so that's so and so it was it's not like that anywhere else it's just like fans are fans but like you know like they appreciate you as the player they appreciate you as a person you know and like they really you know they're really like loving almost and like you get a sense of love out here even after a bad game like you know like there's people that get stuff thrown at them after like bad games you know, over here, you have a bad game. It's like, oh, fight next game. You know, like, it, it's a culture. It's, it's, it's a culture that I feel like really embraced me before I embraced it. So, uh, you know, over time, like, I, I, you know, learn a little bit of Japanese, you know, to be able to say s- s- simple things. Started venturing out, like, you know, seeing what was around me more and more. Started trying the food more and more. It took some time, but, like, you know, I adjusted. Yeah, and um, so now I want to go into your Kyoto days. So you went from Shiga to Kyoto, I think your third year. Um, that's actually, I think, uh, neighboring prefectures. Mm-hmm. Um, 
what was the big difference there in terms of lifestyle? Uh, I think Kyoto's, yeah, I mean, Kyoto is one of the most traditional Japanese cultures as well. So um, there must have been an adjustment there as well. Uh, there was an adjustment, but I, it, it was actually easier going to Kyoto because Kyoto was like a much bigger city. Like even like I was more willing or more likely more ones going to venture out because like, you know, like you have more restaurants, you have like more j- just places that you can go and just like, you know, like like explore. You, you, you can be a tourist there. And on top of that, there's like tourism there, you know, it being a traditional city. So you just see all types of different people. Um, and it, it, it was it was it, it was cool to me. Like, I, I thought Kyoto was a cool city. Like, I think that it's one of those cities that, you know, like even people from the outside were like, oh, my gosh, like I, I would have friends in America. Like, oh, my gosh, like you have the Golden Temple by you. I didn't even know it at first. But like then, like whenever I started really hearing like my American friends talking about like, all right, well. I have this here. It's the same thing like I was talking about before. You have it here. A lot of people put stuff like that on their bucket list. And this is a city that I was living in. So, you know, I embrace like venturing out and not sitting in the house all the time. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, I adjusted to it. You know, I, uh, my, my, I've always had good teammates, you know, all, in, in all my years. Josh was my teammate for a year. And like Marcus Dove had been there the year before. So he kind of showed me around a little bit. And, yeah, like I, I just embraced it. And then the last two years I had Dave with me and like Dave had never been in Japan. So I got the opportunity to show him around and like show him uh, uh, Japan and, you know, like and then we grew in our friendship and we were pretty close. So, uh, yeah, man, Kyoto was dope. Yeah, that's always one of my favorite things is when you get teammates that have never been here before or experienced the culture to kind of like take them and break them in a little bit, teach them about the food and the how polite the culture is and everything. It's always a uh-huh, cool experience, uh-huh. right? Right, right. You just, you get that, like someone, someone shows you that stuff. Some, so you go through your learning process and then like someone else gets there. You're like, I, right, I'm about to show them how it's done. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's always, it's always a good feeling. It's always, and it's always good to have teammates that, you know, you rock with teammates that you get along with that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for you guys to be on the same page. It's easy for you guys to communicate, like, you know, things, one sneeze like you know simple as a costco run like you know like me and dave used to make costco runs together stuff like that you know it's a lot of times especially as imports were all we have i also made some friends like locally too in kyoto which was uh really nice uh people would invite us to you know like dinners and stuff like that like yeah kyoto was a nice city that that city i feel like really embraced me too and i'm forever thankful to their fans so you're in Toyama now, and as we talked about before, you having, you're, having, you're having a really good season, and so is your team. But I just wanted to take a minute uh, before we segue into something else to talk about that fan base a bit. Let's talk about how they've embraced you, because I played half the season there last year, and I felt like in that five months they really embraced me, me and my family. They were, they were just awesome, and I felt like one of, that was one of the best fan bases in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um. Toyama, I mean, kind of. when I tell you, like, probably the, my favorite thing about Toyama has probably been the fan base and, like, how supportive they are. And, uh, man, like, they, they, they really are, like, into their basketball. But then the, they also, like, are really into you. Like, now I'll post something, like, on Instagram or something, and the next thing I know, like, the fans are, like, on Twitter having a conversation about it, you know, stuff like that. Like, uh, they take an interest with you. They're very supportive. I mean, that they show up you know, to the games, you know, they cheer, like, uh, and, and it's probably the best part about, you know, Toyama and, and like coming here because I definitely hate the snow, but you know, it's, you come in and you come in and, and you didn't experience snow. Like we experienced snow. This I did year. Not, oh, it's been horrific. It's been horrific. We had like a foot and a half last week and today it was like 69 and sunny. Dude, when I was there, I think it might've snowed a little bit one time. That was it. Yeah, I don't understand. I guess I brought it with me. I'm ice cold, you know what I mean? But what about that mountain view, though? <laughs> now, the mountain view, man. I, I was, uh, We were at the ice and sports facility, and I was driving. I was just, I almost got into an accident just staring at the mountain, <laughs> just driving, staring. Yeah, no, it's mesmerizing with that and the snow up top on it. It's, man, T- Toyama, it's like, it's not like the liveliest place in the world, but, like, if you embrace the city, like, you figure out, where you can fit in like where there's like restaurants you enjoy going to uh which you know i go to starbucks down the street uh because i live right by the gym 
Uh, I got a couple, you know, like like my go-to spots and stuff like that. So like it, it's it's been as a community, you know, from the basketball side, I feel embraced and I feel also connected to the city just from like a, you know, social aspect and just like, you know, nothing to do with basketball. So yeah, I, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed my time here thus far. Yeah, make sure you go to the beaches too, because they actually have some really nice beaches there when it starts to warm up. Uh, yeah, I heard. I have I have a friend that I knew out here through Ira. His name is Andy. Uh, and he's told me about, you know, when, once when it's warm out, the people like, you know, gather around the beaches. The beaches are nice and that the water is nice and, and, and the weather gets really nice. I, I heard it gets really hot. So I plan on going to the beach it in does. the spring a little bit. And I also plan on hitting the golf, golf range a little bit, you know, getting some uh yeah, so I'm I'm about to be cracking people in top golf this summer. That's for sure. Or like our American audience, what uh, city would you compare Toyama to, like in the states? Ooh, Toyama. See, Toyama's like country. It's like countryside, but then it's also like a big. It's randomly a big city. Low it key, is, man. you know, like you're driving through. Like I'm by the station passage over there by Shogun, and I'm like. These are some big buildings. This is a big mall. So I don't really know how to like explain. It's almost Indianapolis. Like if, I, if I'm going to be honest, because it's not like the biggest city probably in Japan, but like, you know, it's like, it's enough, you know, if that makes sense, it's enough. Uh, and then like on the outskirts, you got like the suburbs, like, you know, kind of the more country places. Cause like I live right by the train station, but then like, you know, a certain practice facilities will go to, you know, I'll be driving like literally in the middle of nowhere, like by, by mountains and the wine and roads and everything like that. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's almost weirdly set up the way it is. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Ike. You were here. Uh, it, it makes sense to me. Like I can agree with everything you said. It's like you'll be within five minutes. You could be feeling like you're in downtown of a big city or in the countryside uh -huh. within a five minute exactly. drive. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's really man. Unique but, like that. Yeah, not, 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 that's the best way to describe it. Like you don't, you don't know. It, depending on what side of Toyama you're on, you, you don't know how you might feel. <laughs> so, um, going back to the Toyama team, uh, you guys are currently, um, I guess, in, in a playoff contention. Um, so, mm -hmm. what's the second half of the season looking for you, and what are you looking uh, for your team to improve on? Um. First things first, we got man, we got a lot of tough games coming up. And we got Okinawa this weekend. We got uh Tokyo on Wednesday. I kind of forget who we play next week, but I, I'm pretty sure it's somebody that's not gonna be an easy team. But I mean we should gotta be focused. Uh, we gotta be focused on certain little things. Uh one thing that we've talked about is uh turnovers, turning the ball over. Uh we gotta be more focused. Uh coach gave us a stat uh, on our ball screen defense. We're number one in the league as far as guarding the role man, but we're also dead last in the league as far as guarding the ball handler. So, uh, you know, we got to make adjustments, proper adjustments to make sure that we, you know, our defense gets better in, in the points that we have weakness. And then uh, as far as our offense is concerned, it's, man, it's so we, we have so many different ways to attack and score. And we, we want to focus more on having less empty possessions you know what i mean i mean we're i think we're number one in offensive efficiency but whenever we watch our games man there's so many possessions that we come down and nothing happens so being more efficient offensively definitely and then just uh doing a few things defensively uh to you know take care of like you know it might be like five points a game from a pick and roll that we give up and if we can get rid of that you know that, that that'll help us moving forward uh, but aside from that, I think, you know, not turning the ball over, that's a big thing for us. Uh, because whenever we don't turn the ball over, we're so efficient in our scoring that we're most likely going to get a bucket. Okay, so I want to pivot away from basketball for a second. Um, it's a common trend for guys when you start to hit those 30s and you know, like, mm -hmm. we're not going to play till, we, till we're 50, you start <laughs> to want to – get into things outside of the court. For instance, you've gotten into some real estate. Walk us through that journey. Mm -hmm. How's that been? Uh, man, real estate is, first of all, real estate is fun. Uh, I think that, so my first uh, attempt at investing was in stocks. Uh, and then, you know, I also invest in like, you know, like some, some of my friends, like little small projects that they have. But like my first real investing where I really put some money into something with stocks. Uh, 
And, you know, like I, I was pretty successful with stock picks, but it was just so at the same time, like kind of boring to me because it was like, it's just these companies. It's like these big, already rich, filthy, rich corporations. You know, a lot of my favorite companies were companies that, you know, from I was I was looking at this the other day because I kind of just got back into stocks too. Like a lot of the companies were companies that have, you know, came up like the, my biggest investment I ever made in a company was Shopify. And uh, I actually sold like all, my, all of my positions. Uh, we won't say how many, but like in Shopify, uh, when the pandemic started, because I panicked, I'm like, yeah, man, this is going to happen. But like, I think it was just such a rush panic of the outside world. And I think that if I would have kept my money in there, I think that it would be like time spike right now. Because Shopify is, I had it, I sold it under $400 a share and it's like at 1500 right now in the course wow. of a year, literally. Like oh, it's, wow. it's crazy. So, uh, but my biggest thing is about um, stocks was like, yeah, I can be smart and make smart picks, but like, I don't have any control over it, you know? And then, so like, whenever I started, Shane Whittington, me and him started having some conversations because he was really into real estate. Uh, so like, I just got this book uh, that I read. It was called uh, Investing, Long Distance Real Estate Investing or something like that. It was an audio book. And um, I listened to it. I would listen to it every day on the way to practice kind of learning the ins and outs when something was confusing. I would go on YouTube or I would go just get on Google and look it up. And, it, you know, it'd be kind of explained. So then uh, finally I decided I was going to, you know, get into the game. Uh, and yeah, man, like it, it's just fun because like a lot of people don't understand how many pieces are, uh, go to that puzzle of a house, man. Like, you know, a lot of people don't like every little thing, like the doorknobs, like the door hinges, the just the door alone the screws, the different size screws that go, you, you get what I'm saying? So it's like, imagine every single thing in the house. And, and like this, this year, I'm actually starting to get into development, you know, doing new builds. So like, imagine every single little piece that goes into putting that big old house up, like, you know, kind of having control over that. It kind of gives you a sense of like a lot of power and a lot of responsibility, you know, but like, it, it's fun. Because like, you know, you put it together and you put it together right, you know, you can make money from it. And I think that the number one thing I, I see about real estate is, you know, some things are inevitable, like getting hungry, eating, you know, breathing and people needing somewhere to live. So people are always going to need somewhere to live. Uh, and there's so many different ways you can invest in real estate. There's so many different ways you can have a business as far as real estate, whether it's wholesaling, whether it's long term rentals, whether it's like, you know, quick flips new builds. Uh, I mean, there's, there's just a plethora of things that you can do. Can we go into your portfolio? Like how many properties you currently hold? Uh, um, I've got, so, so what I have going on right now, active is I have a, a flip. So there's this area in Indianapolis called Fountain Square. Uh, this is probably the fastest gentrifying area in Indianapolis. And it's a flip that I got. Uh, and <laughs> there was like a shed on it. It was like, it was funky. I ripped everything else out of it. Yeah, it, it was like a shed, knocked down the shed. And so like, imagine a house that's sitting right here. And then over here was the shed. So we knocked down the shed and then put in um, a, an attached garage to the house that attaches to the house. And on top of that garage, put on the deck, you know, like so that whenever you're upstairs at this house, added an addition, and then you walk out of that addition, you're out there on the patio, on the outdoor patio. It's nice. Because like in my mind, I'm thinking, how can you maximize, you know, return on investment? There, there wasn't really a yard there. There wasn't a garage. So it's like, okay, you build a garage. And since there's no yard on top of the garage, just build that deck. Now you got some outdoor entertainment space. Uh, so that one was a huge project that I just finished up. Uh, I'm still deciding whether I want to uh, rent it out or, you know, you know, or sell it. It just depends on what makes the most sense. But like in that area, I think prices are going to continue to go up. So it might not be a bad idea to hold on to it and keep it as a rental. And, you know, it's, it's crazy how fast in a gentrifying area that people are pumping money in, into, like how fast, like the prices of these houses go up. Uh, uh, other than that, I've got another uh, flip, uh, flip that I'm going to do. It's, it's going to be a, a big major renovation. Um, and it's like a, it was a three bed, one bath, and I'm going to turn it into like a four bed, three bath. Like, yeah, like just just gut, gut everything out. I'm, I'm really like 
just go in there and take everything out. We're just going to redo everything. Open space is a big thing that I like to do uh, because I mean, p- people just want to want to feel free when they're in their house. Uh, so that's going to be that's going to be like a eight, six to nine month project, seven, seven to nine month project. And then uh, I just started a, the permitting process for I'm building uh, my, my first new, new build is a three story development. So it's like a first floor open area, you know, a nice kitchen open area. And then on the second floor, there's going to be um, two bedrooms. And then one of the bedrooms got like an outdoor patio going out onto it. And then the master suite is going to be on the third floor. Uh, with, with, and then you got a wet bar area and then another larger size deck that goes out to the back. So that that's going to be, that's going to be a monster. So yeah, I've, I've, I guess I've been doing uh, like these big projects, but I also, last season, uh, one of the more successful like flip stories I have, dude, I got I got a house in January, wait, December maybe, and flipped it without, I never saw it. To this day, I've never seen it. Flipped it in like 30 days, had it back on the market, and sold within like 70 days of getting it. Wow. And like had like a 40%, 50% return on investment. That's big time. Yeah, it was crazy. So it's just, but it's this education, all all this stuff is like out there for people to get. Like like in the morning I wake up and I get on Zillow instead of Instagram. Like I'll just see like what new properties are out there. You know, I got to make my time for Instagram and all that. But like, I'll look at like when new properties are out there. If it makes sense, you know, you you don't bet on the, you don't invest in the house. You invest in the, the deal. You know, that's the name of the game. Yeah. You invest in the deal. So, uh, yeah, man, I'm just, I'm just trying to like build, you know, eventually I got, I want to do, I want to get an apartment building, you know, like it's my goal by the time I'm 40 to own, you know, a certain number of units, you know, that passive income, you know, our our window is so small to play and make money that we make, you know? Uh, so just continuing to build, and taking that money and putting it to good use is important because like, I mean, even me right now, I'm, I'm going to buy a car this summer, but I, I haven't had a car like the last three years. Two, three yeah, years. man, relax, man. Relax, relax. You don't need that. No, no, we, we, There's we, depreciating we and appreciating assets. Yeah, I know. But, you know, after you done made a little bit of extra money on top of the yeah. salary by investing in the right stuff, hey, you listen, can reward yourself. Go, go rent yourself something that's super, super nice and let them ride that depreciation down. I'll think about it. We'll, we'll, we'll have t- this conversation. We'll get a you a two time. month rental. <laughs> two month rental, some nice. It's gonna be like, that's gonna be expensive. It's not as expensive. I don't as know a new about car. y'all. I get more than two months at home. Nah, nah, I'm nah. not gonna be back here until September. June, July, August. We'll talk about that off wax. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it off, off camera. Off camera. Top five. Top five. Is going to how about what's your um I guess we t- we say this to every guest basketball guest uh who's been the most impressive Japanese player to date to date overall that I've seen yeah. man I got to be honest what Kosuke's doing this year in Aisha man hey that I you used to tell me but like the shots he makes are ridiculous man like oh, I know. It's crazy. Like what I'm seeing out of all the Japanese, and there's a lot of good Japanese guys. I like Yuki Togashi. I like Daiki in Tokyo. I like Naoki's it. really nice. Uh, Naoki's nice. Yeah, exactly. I like Namizato. I mean, there's a lot of good Japanese players, but but I, I kind of feel at this point in time as just Japanese only, what Kosuke is doing in Aishin is kind of almost head and shoulders above everyone. I mean, he will drop 30. And I, I've watched some of these games, and like they'll put an American on him. He doesn't care. He'll drop thirty and not break a sweat. And not, yeah, it's it's it looks so effortless to him. And what one thing I can say about him too this season more than I've seen in the past. I'm not calling him a defensive stopper or anything, but like I feel like he's more invested, uh, you know, in just like one on one defense because like I can remember, you know, our games that we played against him this year, uh, and more so like in Kyoto, like a, a lot of times we would say, you know, attack him, but like. He, you know, he's kind of – he's playing a little bit hard on that end of the floor. But, look, as an offensive player, like what he's doing right now, he's <laughs> – yeah, yeah, he's cold. 
He's cold. He's a sneaky competitor, though, man. He doesn't like when people try to pick on him on defense. It kind of fuels him a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he'll it. So now he'll you know try to get a stop on. And you know you leave him open. This like I think that him more so than anyone in, in this league. Like like I, I remember there was a game we were playing. We, we had got, I think we were we were mixed up between playing zone and man. I remember the feeling that I had. Like he was wide open in the corner and I was in the paint. And it was probably probably supposed to be my pickup. I saw the ball. I saw the ball swing into him. And then media, I was like, "Dang, get back on defense." That's a bucket. That's a bucket. And I knew it. It's like it doesn't matter if I close out late. Anything. That's a bucket. Yo, you know me. I'm a re. I'm an. I'm a re. I'm an offensive rebounder. Like I've Uh got more offensive rebounders than anybody in the B league. Uh When he used to shoot the ball, I would get back on defense. I would look (laughs) at it and would be like, "Okay, I'm good." No, like, but then it's also fun. And, like, part of it is, too, like, I'll hear about practice or I'll hear about, like, you know, more, like, the feeling and the flow of the game. Like, and like Shane, you got to understand, like, so one, one of my best friends in this league is Shane Whittington. And, uh, you know, he'll just be talking to me about, like, setting him screens and stuff like that. Like, and then, like, he'll he'll he'll, he'll talk about how, like, he'll just be coming off. And it's like, dang, I didn't get his man. He's probably about to swing this. He said it doesn't matter, like. You give him like an inch of daylight, it doesn't matter. Like he makes more tough shots than probably even a lot of some of these Americans in the league. I don't know about me myself, but he makes some tough shots, man. Like he's a special player. Speaking of you, that game against Chiba, bro. Bro, the shots you were hitting. What what was going through your mind? You were just just I on? Know. I was I was I was on, but I was fueled a little bit by the day before because, like, the day before, like, I kind of, you know, I I I, I kind of felt like I didn't, you know, go out there and I didn't go out there aggressively, and you know, like, I I had this feeling like watching them, like, like it, it was it, it almost felt like they weren't t- taking us seriously, like you know, like you know, like in a sense. So like I, I remember saying like, no, nah, we're we're gonna come back tomorrow. It's gonna be different, and you know, like I, I was I was definitely just in the zone. Um, and I don't do stuff like that a lot because I think, you know, at the end of the day, basketball is a team game. Like there's so many different ways that we can score. And like, and I can really be honest when I say like, I don't care. I, I've never cared since I've been probably in Cheetah about like trying to like compete for like one of the best, you know, leading the league in scores. I have a lot of offensive tools that I'll need to when the time is, is right or whenever I need to. But like, you know, like we got Josh inside, we got Naoki in transition. We got Maya though. We got Okada on the perimeter. We, we got Yoshi is also good on the perimeter. But, you know, at certain points in time when you just feel like you're in the zone, like, you know, you do whatever you can and take over. Like, I, I was trying to do whatever I could to make sure that we didn't lose that game. And the fact that I shot 11 for 17 from the free throw line and we lost by one point still kills me. I kind of want to go into that. Um, so you had the opportunity to have a four-point play at the end of regulation. Uh-huh. What was your mind doing at the time when you were walking to the line, and you could have sealed Bro, the game you, at that? that Yuki, point. Yuki, uh, Yuki started chirping. He's like, "Hey, hey, rebound, rebound! He's gonna miss." I'm like, "He does." That. When he said that, yeah, he's like, "Rebound! He's gonna miss." And like, he kind, I'm not. I don't think he got into my head. I think I got into my own head. I was like, "Nah, nah, we're going home. We're going home." But then, like, it was just like I got up to the line, and then it was like. I, I don't know if I, you know, free throws are so mental. And, like, I just, like, left it so short, man. Like, I, I wish I could have that free throw back. I'm, I, You know, I think I'm having my worst free throw shooting performance this season so far. So, um, I need to kind of come up with a routine. Like, you know, make, getting, like, 20 makes in a row after practice every day or something. Because the way I'm shooting free throws right now is unacceptable. Bro, I'm in the same boat right now. Like It's, it's, it's low 50s shoot? right now, bro. It's low 50. It's low. I'm usually like almost 70. Bro, it's been, I'm low 50s right now. Yeah, we, all right, we're going to keep, we're going to hold each other accountable. We I'm going to text you after practice uh, the next coming day. Like, how, many, how many free throws you made after practice? And, bro, I'm shooting like 12 a game. Woo! I'm, I'm throwing, I'm throwing buckets away. You're leaving out there, brother. Bro. You're leaving a lot of points on, hey, you're leaving a lot of points out there. I'm throwing them away right now. Is that yeah, is that purely yeah. a mental thing for you guys or? I, for me, it's mental, man. 98% of like, it's mental. It's mental, man. Like, because 
Cause like whenever I was stepping up, I mean, I'm, you saw where I was pulling from against Chiba. Like I was pulling up, like this is cash. And I just get to the line, like I get anxiety, bro. Like I don't know. So this, I, I gotta, yeah, I gotta fix that. Like I, I don't think I've been as focused on uh, on it enough. Uh, so I, I definitely gotta, I gotta get back to the drawing board on those. For sure. Yeah, I think uh, recently I saw Draymond on another podcast and he was talking about how he was shooting high 30s from the three and then all of a sudden just like he can't shoot at all. But he'll in practice, he like he kills. Like, he, he makes right. everything. But he just says he sees a sports psychologist now to kind of like get his mentals right. And even a guy right. like him, right, has all the resources right. I mean, available. Some, is there so much mental like with basketball you know a lot of it is physical and like i think that whenever your physical and mental can be on the same page at a high level like those are the best basketball players like i mean you look at a guy like lebron james man like the amount of work he puts in i'm not even talking about what he does like actually we are talking about what he does on the court but like what he does on the court at the age he's at at 36 years old i still think he's the best player in the nba I think that there's a lot of mental preparation in that. I think he holds a lot of his real estate in a lot of people's heads. And then aside, from, you know, just that sense of fear. But aside from that, the, the mental taking care of the physical, like he's he prepares himself physically so much, you know, with this rehab, with this treatment, with this, you know, strength and conditioning routine that, you know, everything just clicks. And it's crazy. He's 36 and he. No, but Julian, <laughs> listen, Jr. used to say this to me all the time. He says a lot of people think think that your prime is a number, like an age, mm -hmm. like 30 or 31 is your prime. He would say, yeah. no, he said your prime is when your mental and your physical both come together at the same time. He said that's Bam. when you're in your prime because he said his prime was when he was 30, 35 or 36. He said that's when I entered my prime because I stopped depending only on my physical abilities, I started to use my mind and basketball yeah. became as easy as, as it, it has ever been. And I think that's yeah. what happened with LeBron this year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously he's still got the physical tools, but the way he picks people apart, you know, with his brain and with his passing ability. Three point those, shooting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I really, I really think he's a legitimate MVP candidate this year at 36. And that, that's that's special, man. He should have like eight of them already, but you know, people get bored of voting for the same person. All the time. They do. All right, Julian, we're going to transition to uh, the Mount Rushmore section of the podcast. It's going to be a top four of whatever subject we throw at you. Uh, mm -hmm. We talked about investing, so I kind of want to know your top five stock picks, including top four or top five. Oh, sorry, top four, top, top four. four. So top that four, top four uh, stock picks, or uh, you can include cryptocurrency as well. For well, you got to give me a time here. Talking about for, for long term holds. Let's go. Let's go five years. Five years. I'm gonna go Shopify, uh, e commerce. Uh, I'm gonna go one y'all might have never heard of Mercado Libre. It's kind of actually like the Amazon of like South America. Okay. Uh, growth potential is out of this world. I'm gonna go JD jd.com out of china and then man i gotta stick to old faithful man i gotta go with apple i like apple because i think it's a growth stock and they offer that dividend but amazon man amazon. Tesla. no 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 i gotta back up i gotta back up i'm not even gonna go tesla i want to go tesla but it's overvalued i'm gonna go with square square that's a good square is a good pick very good pick and you got the crypto play as well. And then I'm, I'm going to go with, what is it called? Ethereum? Ethereum. Ethereum. Yeah. Ethereum. Ethereum. Yeah. I'm not invested in it, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to gamble on that one. I should have prefaced uh, this whole thing to say that this is not a financial advice. It's just purely Yeah, I, I am not a financial <laughs> professional. If you use these picks and they blow up and go up, feel free to thank me. But if they go down, it ain't got nothing to do with me. It's <laughs> <laughs> a fact. All right, Julian. Uh, it was a fun time talking with you. Um, can you plug in your social media or where people can find you? And uh, what else you got going on in your life other than basketball? Man, it's basketball right now. I'm just now. I think I feel like I've been so focused on, you know, 
this season and uh you know I only signed a one year deal in Toyama so you know we've, we've got had a strong start to the season and try to make sure that I have a strong finish as well so a lot of uh extra work in my free time as far as like going to the weight room I got a ghost gym across the street from me and um and other than that uh just kind of figuring out like what I might want to do after you know I think that there's no reason why anyone should wait until like the wheels are falling off to start thinking, oh, what's going to be next? So, you know, whether that's going to be real estate, I think real estate is always going to be a part of my life. But there's uh, other ideas I have and other people that I'm like talking with and, you know, trying to figure out. I, I know a couple uh, people that are really successful, you know, in the business world. And I just try to learn and, you know, soak up as much information from them as I can. Uh, because one thing that someone told me that resonated is like, you never want to be the smartest person in the room. True. Yeah. So social uh, media? Social media. I think it's Mavunga32 on Instagram and we got Mavunga on Twitter. So follow me. Hit me up. I tweet back sometimes if I can understand it. If y'all tweet me in that kanji or that katakana, if, if Google Translate does not give me a good translation, there's nothing I can do there. But I have one more question before we uh before we go to the outro. Mm-hmm. Who's the better Mavunga, you or your sister? Man, I gotta go, man. Oh, <laughs> no, nah, nah, I want it on wax. I want it on wax. Give her her flowers. I, I, I gotta, I gotta <laughs> give it to my little sister. Man. Gotta, give her her flowers. I, I gotta. She, she, she's a monster, man. She's a monster. My little sister is cold, Like she's a problem. She's nice, bro. Yeah, she's I mean, she's got it. And her bag is expanding as well. Oh, really? Yeah. So, you know, she's just she's a, she's an extremely hard worker as well. Like I actually for a good almost month, I think. Uh, so I told you I was lifting with Shane this summer and she came to the weight room with us. And I'm not going to lie to you, bro. Like her pace that she was moving at, like we're doing like supersets and everything. It's like or we're doing like, uh, you know, what do you call it when it's around like uh, circuits, circuit, circuit. We're doing a circuit and she's she's catching the number to us almost laughing us and stuff. Like she works. So uh, you know, having an opportunity, you know, as her being my sister, and now we're grown ups and working out with her this summer in the gym. That was special, man. Like she grinds. This is some of whom good thing to grind. But she can't be one on one though. Let that be <laughs> No, she's a ball magnet, bro. It's just when she's on the floor, the ball just finds her. Yeah. She's, all, she's always around it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. But you know, she, she, she. The, the number one thing I will say about being good at a certain point in time, you're like, you got to be hungry for that next level. And you know, I try to always like, you know, motivate her and tell her like, okay, you're here now. Now that you're here, how do you get here? Now that you're there, how do you get to there? I mean, that that's that's just life for us. That's life on and off the court. You know, constantly trying to improve ourselves. X. All right, um, trying to be meaningful with our time here. So, uh, Ike, you want to take us out? All right, you guys, once again, Julian, special thank you for coming through, man. We really appreciate you. Much appreciated, fellas. I had fun. Um, definitely going to be checking out the other episodes as well. I'm going to make sure I tell my people that they need to check it out. I like you guys' podcast. All right, thank you, man. But once again, you guys, this has been the Ike Max podcast. Please like, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks, Julian. You're welcome.